Well, hello everyone, it's Scott Myers here, and in this short video, we're gonna talk about some of the steps to take to start or develop your first self-storage facility, primarily the top three mistakes that newbie investors make and how to avoid them. Okay, so first of all, why self-storage? Well, that's because there's more opportunities in self-storage than any other form of rental real estate. How about 24 million rental units out there across this country right now? Also, it's becoming a $220 billion industry in this country right now, representing just a, a huge opportunity for an investor to get in. And why? Well, that's because it's become somewhat of a consumer product. Yeah, it's, it's real estate. It's a small business. But one in 10 households rents one or more self-storage rental units in this country right now, making it, again, a, a consumer product that people need and use. And demand is on the rise. Let's face it, we are a nation of pack rats, and people have an insatiable appetite in this country for self-storage. And why else would we be looking at self-storage right now? Well, that's because it has higher returns than any other form of real estate. Um, it may be one of the reasons why you're here. You've seen all the positive press lately about how self-storage continues to outperform all the other asset classes. Um, as a matter of fact, the next closest competitor in terms of returns is apartments. Last year only returned 8.8% compared to 34.5% for self-storage. Healthcare, retail, office, industrial, and lodging. Well, I feel sorry for those folks down there four times more profit than apartments when it comes to investing in self-storage and certainly outpaces all other forms. Okay, Scott, well, why would I go out and do that when I can just go out and buy a single family house? It's real easy to get into, they're all over the place. Well, <laughs> compare that to single family returns as well. If we get out of the commercial sector, 5.3% national average. That's why. And as a matter of fact, Michael Lombardi, who tracks single family investments of rental real estate, you know, he made the comment recently, my opinion is that the U.S. housing market is dead for years to come. So, there you have it. Okay, so my story. Uh, well, I have invested in all other forms of uh, real estate. Uh, that has been my experience and my background. Uh, all types of single-family homes. We ramped up the apartment side of our businesses, offices, warehouses, um, until it took us to the point of a uh, near bankruptcy. Then I got formal education and I bought my first self-storage facility and I decided, hey, this is the way to go. And I sold off all other forms of uh, real estate and we've continued to buy and develop ever since. We've uh, purchased over 2,000 units and we've developed over 400,000 square feet of self-storage to date. Well, people began to notice what we were doing along the way and I was asked to speak nationally at some real estate investment groups and other investor and small business groups all across the country and I humbly accept the fact that now I am the nation's leading instructor on how to invest in self-storage facilities. And we founded our, our company selfstorageinvesting.com several years ago and now, now that is the internet's most powerful resource for teaching other folks how to go out and buy and develop their own and launch their own self-storage business as well. Okay. Fantastic, Scott, but interested in the business, where do I find these self-storage facilities? Well, target mail takes a little bit of work, but this, this is where we're going to find the deals. you got to look under the rocks, and we're sending out mailers to the self-storage facility owners themselves, targeting the mom and pops, not the big uh, regional and national players. We're not going to answer our, our mail or our phone calls anyway. We're targeting the mom and pop owners. We're also partnering with the commercial brokers and also the self-storage brokers. And they supply us an endless supply of leads to be able to track down. And then don't forget the business brokers. There's an awful lot of sellers and owners out there that treat their self-storage facilities as a small business rather than commercial real estate. So we're also working with the business brokers who are supplying those facilities to us and getting on their, their business brokerage, small business brokerage websites. And then internet searches, just a kind of a catch-all in addition to these, to look for self-storage for sale, comma, your, your city. Google self-storage for sale, comma, your city to catch anything and everything else that may be out there. All right, we're going to talk about the top three mistakes that newbie investors make and how to avoid them. And mistake number one that I've seen over the years that I've been coaching and mentoring folks is, is improper analysis. Folks, they're, they're trying to piece together software or get to a best guess or looking at uh, broker's figures or seller figures and determine what is this thing worth and am I overpaying for a self-storage facility? How do I know what this thing is worth? And there's an awful lot of fear in that. Um, use use the, the number one resource, the number one software out there for analyzing deals. Go to selfstorageanalysis.com. This is the software that, that we use and that the pros use for analyzing self-storage facilities. There's nothing else out there on the market like it for analyzing self-storage facilities and the market for determining net operating income, cap rates, and getting down to the bottom line, which is what is this thing worth? It takes the guesswork out of it. Also, don't forget the market as well. If the numbers look good on the facility, um, physical standpoint, it looks great. Well, what about the market? Will it support this self-storage facility? For those of you that are looking to develop as well, 
you need to be drawing a one, a three, and a five mile ring and a radius around the self-storage facility that you're looking to buy or land that you're looking to develop and finding out what the supply index is. Is it overbuilt right now or will it be able to withstand more storage? What is the competition in your market? Can you beat up on the folks that are there? Are they not doing a very good job? Or is it formidable competition that you may have a tough time breaking into this market and stealing some of those customers, customers away and or gaining new ones above your competition who's already entrenched? And then, will the market itself kind of support it? You know, what are the demographics and the, the demand? Is the population increasing? Is it decreasing? What is the median income? You know, what is the overall demand and what are the trends in the market as it pertains to not only occupancy but job growth and the demand for storage in a market? Okay, great Scott. Uh, interested in the business but the biggest question I have is how do you fund these things? Uh, I heard that there's no financing out there during this recession and as we're coming out of it for self-storage, how do I get the money for these things? Well, you know what? We're still going back to the same places we went to before and that's the community banks, savings and loans, credit unions, because those are the folks that are clamoring for self-storage because self-storage has done so well during this recession and also during all recessions and inflationary periods. As a matter of fact, self-storage only has an 8% loan failure rate on average compared to all the other asset classes. Well, comparing back again to apartments, apartments have a 53% loan failure rate in this country. So these banks, they want the self-storage deals because they know that they perform and they won't have to try to sell these things off or take them back. The SBA also has two new programs that are available for self-storage that they don't offer for any other form of real estate because they too know that this is the asset class that outperforms all others and has such a low loan default rate. Sellers are financing their deals as well. These mom and pop owners have paid off, paid down their facilities. They don't want to pay capital gains taxes on them and so they're offering seller financing so that they can still get a check once a month for their self-storage facility to further capital gains taxes and also not have to manage their facility. It's kind of a win-win-win for not only them, but you as buyers. Private lenders, well, really akin to the community banks and the SBA. Um, these are wealthy individuals that, that are running out their own banking business, if you will, and they are coming out of the woodworks looking for self-storage development deals and deals to loan on existing facilities because they too see that this is the best opportunity in real estate right now and also has the lowest loan default rate. <laughs> pretty, pretty impressive, and uh, this is what private lenders are looking for. Mezzanine lenders, these are lenders that are bridging the gap. If you don't have enough down payment for your facility um, compared to what the, the bank is going to give you, these mezzanine lenders are bridging the gap and they too love self-storage and they'll help you get the rest of the way there depending upon how much money you have to put down. And if you still need a little help to get along the way, uh, well there's debt and equity partners out there as well and this is a very, very easy story to tell to those individuals that are the stock market refugees that are tired of the returns that they're getting to become partners with you. Now, caution here uh, on who you go into partnership with, but you know what? I would gladly give up 50% of a deal because rather than let it go because 100% of nothing is nothing. So begin looking at some debt and equity partners that you may be able to partner with as well to help to get you into these deals to begin with. Okay, mistake number two kind of encompasses a lot here. Um, I see a lot of folks make a really bad deals because the deals were structured incorrectly. They weren't really structured to last. When their adjustable rate mortgage came due, they didn't create enough value in the facility to be able to refinance it and pull money out of it. There was no operating agreement drawn up between the debt and equity partners and, uh, well, amongst them all, and a lot of partner divorces are causing these deals to go south and not getting refinanced and being sold um, on the market as distressed properties. No attorney. Well. Scott, those, things are, those attorneys are expensive and uh, I can't afford that going into this, so um, I don't need an attorney to draft my operating agreement or look at my deal structure. <laughs> Enough said. Poor due diligence, and that encompasses looking at um, the seller's numbers and or the broker's numbers to determine your net operating income. Are these, true, are these income and expense figures true and accurate so that you don't make a mistake before, during, or after the closing and looking at the market as well? It's got a cash flow day one, folks. I've seen so many people that are so anxious to get into a deal that um, they've set a goal that they buy the wrong deal and it doesn't cash flow. And, the, uh, and some of the, something to the effect of, oh, well, I just want to get one under my belt and um, I'll buy another one that's profitable and feed this one and uh, you know, we'll just kind of move along after that. Now, folks, it's got a cash flow from day one, period. No matter what business you're going into and no, no matter what division of a business that you're starting, it's got a cash flow from day one. And then what about your exit strategy? Are you going to have the ability to add or create enough value to be able to sell it at your target date, which is when the loan comes due or when you need to cash out any debt and equity partners. 
Have you thought about the long term? If not, you need to. And mistake number three, it's not an ATM, folks. Um, there's plenty of gurus out there saying these things are cash cows and set it and forget it. I've, I've heard and I've, I've seen it all. Um, folks, this is a business and you gotta treat it like a business. It is not a hobby. You need to have process-based management procedures put in place. Systems run the business and you manage and you tweak the system. And those systems, fortunately for self-storage, include kiosks where you can manage these facilities uh, without having a physical person on site 40 hours a week if you don't want to. And web-based property management software that allows you to monitor what's going on at the self-storage facility even when you're not around. Having a solid marketing plan determining what are you going to be, the market leader in price and amenities, or are you planning to be the low-cost provider? I prefer going with the, uh, the high end, but I'll leave that decision up to you. But at the end of the day, just advertising in the yellow pages, that is not a marketing plan. You need to have a marketing plan that looks out for the entire year. And then local domination. Again, we're looking at one to three to five miles. That is your market and your trade area. How do you get all the eyeballs on your website and all the door swings into your facility versus all your competitors? And that encompasses a whole new set of, uh, a whole new skill set as well. And then expanding square footage. Once you buy this thing, the beauty of self storage is that you can create so much value by increasing the square footage and adding additional buildings and also adding the additional profit centers. And with self storage, there is no other asset class that I have seen or invested in that allows you to add the value. Just force the appreciation by adding truck rental, retail sales of locks, boxes, and moving supplies, propane tanks, um, offering eBay services, lock services. Um, uh, wine storage for furs and gun and arts and other collectibles and temperature control, uh, you name it, the list is endless. Over 40 different profit centers that we've added to our facilities to force depreciation and the value. Uh, recently, we've been adding meth labs to all our facilities. It's a huge profit margin. Just kidding, folks. Just kidding. Uh, no plumbing, no meth labs and self storage. So let's just get that out of the way right now, no matter what you see out there on the internet. Okay, so let's uh, summarize now the top 10 reasons why I love self-storage and another reason why you should continue to look into it as well. It is the most profitable, surging demand. It has been the fastest growing sector of commercial real estate over the past 30 years. There's an abundance of financing options. Private lenders, banks, SBA, they love self-storage because it outperforms everything else. It's recession resistant because what happens during a recession is businesses and individuals are downsizing and therefore that creates a demand for storage. So storage actually is one of those rare industries that benefits even more during a recessionary period than it does during an inflationary period when times are good. But when times are good, woohoo, buy more stuff, don't we? And we have another, creates another opportunity and demand for self storage for all the goodies that we buy when times are good. Automation, you don't have to be at your facility 24 seven. You don't have to have a manager there 40 hours a week. You can use kiosks and web-based property management software to assist in the management of your facilities. And then multiple profit centers and paydays. No other form of real estate allows you all the opportunities over 40 different profit centers and additional paydays and ways to increase the value like self-storage. My favorite is the fact that compared to apartments and single family homes that have eviction laws where uh, you have to kick somebody out after they've destroyed your property and stolen all kinds of money from you and the court calls it non-payment of rent and they give you a little pink piece of paper versus lien laws like we have in self storage where you put a lock on their door, you lock their stuff up and if they don't pay you then you auction it off and you get your money back that way. You've probably seen the show Storage Wars and Auction Hunters and then when they leave this is what you get. You get a concrete floor and a steel box. There is no carpet, there is no paint, there's no plumbing, there's no appliances. That is the reason why I sold off all the other forms of real estate and I invest in nothing but self-storage. And that rounds out uh, my top 10 reasons why I love self-storage is because there are no tenants, no toilets, and no trash. Okay, so interested in more information on where I start, um, as much as I can give you in this short video, here are the next steps. Get formal self-storage training. A lot of free stuff out there on the internet. We offer free information as well, but you really need to get yourself some formal education. That starts by going over to our website, selfstorageinvesting.com. Free resources include a free book called The Blueprint for Success, my self-storage blueprint for success. We've always got case studies that you can pull down and walk through the deals to begin to familiarize yourself with it. It also has a calendar of events of our next upcoming Self Storage Academy. We hold three-day events all around the country. Uh, that is not free, but take a look at an event coming up near you. So head on over to selfstorageinvesting.com, begin pulling down that information, getting your formal education in self storage. So head on over there now and uh, I look forward to seeing you on the other side.